Good morning, happy Thursday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and oh, it is perfect. Hang on, let me get this squared up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so it's Thursday. Always a big day for me because this is this is the day that I uh, relax things a little bit from an eating standpoint. I would normally go to my favorite Mexican restaurant, which has been closed and unavailable to me. But guess what? Great news. Uh, Riviera Maya is open for carryout as of yesterday. So this is very exciting. We will be having our favorite Mexican food tonight for dinner. So congratulations to me. Things are are obviously looking up, as they say. Okay, so a couple quick questions for today because we got to get going. We got a got a big busy day, but I got a, another question from from my boy Zhang, and Zhang asked, uh, "Does the posterior sacral area behave the same as the dorsal rostral area? Does the lower thorax behave the same as the posterior outlet? And does the anterior pubic area behave the same as the sternum?" So what what Zhang's talking about is the iterative representations in the axial skeleton, and he is 100% correct, okay? So especially in these situations where you do not have the full excursion of breathing, which would be identified by limitations in your extremity motion, um, you will have these iterative representations in the upper upper thorax, lower thorax, and, and through the pelvis. It's a little bit harder to see in the pelvis because the, the gradients are a little bit smaller there, but, but the reality is, is that yes, these are iterative re representations, which makes it very, very useful from a measurement standpoint. So if I see a deficit in the, the thorax, I will most likely see that same deficit show up in the pelvis. Um, as long as one, you're measuring it effectively, and as long as your, your perspective is, is correct. And so again, that's why I'm a little bit of a stickler as to how you measure things. So I would go on the YouTube and I would look at a couple of the the, the tests and, and the, um, the way we measure, especially the, the shoulder flexion, hip flexion stand out as, as a, a, a little bit different perspective than what you're probably used to, especially if you're, if you're defaulting to the, the old school method of measurement. So always keep those in mind. The other great thing about this iterative aspect is that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have these situations where, oh, somebody comes in, and you're, you're a little unsure about something. So say they came in with shoulder pain, they're very limited in that shoulder because of the pain. You can actually use the ipsilateral hip as a representation of what's going on at the shoulder. So that might help guide your treatment in, in, in um, coming up with a solution when you can't really get a good representation of what is possible in that shoulder because of, of the, the pain that the patient is dealing with. So thank you, Zhang. That's a really good question and you are on track, so, so stay on it. Um, I got another question from uh, Johnny and Johnny wants to know, as clinicians, what are some ways to recon reconcile the biopsychosocial aspects of the pain experience with all the fun physics applications regarding patient encounters, assessment and treatment decisions? It seems like the rehab industry is divided and it has to be one style of treatment or the other. I don't know if we're divided or not. I don't, I don't think so. The thing that people need to recognize is that um, the bio part and the biopsychosocial model is what we've always done. And so we can't ignore that part on any level. It doesn't make it more or less important. It's always mattered how we communicate with patients. It's always mattered what, what type of support systems our patients have. So I don't think that anything is, is all that different. I think that it's just a matter of of an increasing awareness per se, and then people get interested in certain aspects of it, and then that gets magnified, and so then it seems more important. And then, because everybody has access to social media, certain things get a little blown out of proportion uh, because of their personal biases, um, and then th there's a little bit of a battle as far as ownership and turf wars and, and what people think is more important than another. But the reality is that most of those arguments um, are not reality. Uh, people do not offer up what they're actually doing in clinic in many cases. And so, Johnny, I think that the, it's important to have an understanding of all of these influences. And you'll never be perfect and you'll say the wrong things and, and do the wrong things uh, um, because we're human. But the reality is is that we, it's it's no different. We still have to address all of these factors. Um, every time that you work with with a patient or a client, 
and and uh, you know it the only way that you're ever going to rule out a biomechanical factor is if you restore their full movement capabilities to begin with so that is always going to be the foundation of what we do movement is a representation of everything that goes on in the human being that is why our brain is designed as it is and so it may be the most important part when it comes down to it because if if i can influence your movement in a favorable way that feeds back into the system on all levels whether it be thoughts whether it be anxiety um, or whether it be um, something as simple as as being able to rest so uh johnny i think it's a great question i would say continue to educate yourself um if we look at at some of the the physiological um uh educational systems and such that that support understanding pain um you could go the explain pain route you go with with butler and and lorma mosley david butler and lorma mosley um they're the explain pain guys you got adrian lau um, for his, his uh, therapeutic neuroscience um, education aspect of things, um, those are those are probably the, the the two biggies. And I would say that that get a really strong representation there. They've got great information on how to interact with with a patient, but do not do not ignore the movement aspect of things because it is the foundation of everything that we do. So everybody have a great Thursday. I'm going to go enjoy my neuro coffee as I always do. Um, it is outstanding today. I have been killing it. I'm not, not sure what I've been doing, but I'm certainly doing this a whole lot better than I used to. Anyway, have a great Thursday. I'm going to have Mexican food tonight. we got a lot of things to do. Stay busy. Um, go to askbillhartman at gmail.com if you have any questions, and I'll see you later.